Keith McCullough, welcome back to the summit, the last one of the day. I've, uh, I've gone to basically a polymath talking fractals, to a brigadier general, to Josh Crum, who can talk about all this stuff. So uh, welcome back, man. Oh, hi, good to be back. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. Keith. There's, um, there's, there's so much interconnectedness to these topics, like whether it be Chinese risk, yeah. globally in, interconnected risk. Um, you, unlike a lot of people, actually have a, a framework on gold, which is the number one topic I want to hit on today. We're going to get into probably crypto as well, by the way, my, uh, my worst topic in terms sure. of having any legitimate uh, value add. But, yeah. but, but gold itself, I think that, well, first of all, congrats on getting this part of the move right. Yeah. Um, but maybe just you and, and you, how you and Stefan thought about the framework so that people sure. have a basis for that, and then we can talk you know, about that thoroughly. Yeah, sounds good. You, so you got me on for the, uh, you know, the college dorm room session where we are just talking about crypto and gold and religious uh, elements. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, uh, Without alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Or other. <laughs> yeah, so no, uh, but, but yeah, I think that's a good place to start where I can try to give some sort of framework or something you know, useful to your viewers and then we can get down the crypto rabbit hole or, or yep. go elsewhere, where, yep. wherever you want to go. Um, yeah, so, so I think that the, the call was really um, about a couple things. You know, I, I look at these long, these long cycles um, and you know, gold, I, I guess the, you know, one of the mainstream, there's two ways the mainstream kind of looks at it right now. Uh, one is just sort of the pure commodity, supply and demand, you know, sort of uh, counting widgets like, like you would oil or copper or anything else. Uh, and that's sort of a, a Wall Street approach, uh, right? And then so you're looking at, you know, what's the demand for and the flows from, you know, central banking and jewelry and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but in that model, you're sort, of, you're, you're sort of de facto assuming that your denominator, the currency you're measuring in, is some sort of universal truth, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what's, what's important for our framework is we actually really that both the numerator and the no denominator are moving. Mm -hmm. So it's always about relative value, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, so our framework is started thinking about that is, you know, what is that relative value and what's the core driver of each? Um, and Wall Street, you know, again, has, has a very, um, you know, uh, the model that, that was developed uh, at Goldman Sachs you know, just before I joined uh, was very much focused on real interest rates. Um, and, and, you know, they had a whole framework and sort of white paper on, on how it moves around with real interest rates. But I think that only had one part of the equation. What they were really telling you is what, what the dollar was doing mm -hmm. uh, with real interest rates. Uh, yeah. and, and that could have been against any other asset or any other currency. Uh, the gold itself had its own sort of fundamentals in the, in the numerator. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so what we did to model is really try to dissect what is that? What, like, what is that, that that drives gold? And so you, know, you have to step back and, and, again, without getting into the college dorm room uh, too soon, uh, you know, what is money? What is, you know, what, what is gold held for? What is it useful for, right? It doesn't pay a dividend. It's, uh, you know, it's not part of a broader financial system. It's this, you know, this bearer asset. Um, and and what, it, what it really is so is... Um, it, it is actually used. Uh, its monetary properties are actually very similar to its its uh, its properties in industry and 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 you know sort of consumer uh, consumption, uh, which is that it's an element that lasts forever, right? Uh, with a with a it's a very high you know, because of its scarcity, it's got a very high energy cost to produce. Uh, you have to you know crush all the rocks and, and you know, move all and refine. So to, uh, we, we calculated it's about a 60% pure consumable energy cost to, 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 to create gold. Uh, so it's a very, very high energy intensity uh, you know, element, you know, commodity, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then, but what, what is its use case is Jewelry, uh, for the most part, that's that's you know the, the uh, far and away the largest one, and mm -hmm. and we we tend to sort of deminimize that and not think about that because we think about it more as a financial asset in the West. Uh, but if you look at you know billions of people a lot across the world, jewelry is still the most important thing that, that gold is used mm -hmm. for as a store of value. Uh, it, as a store of value, mm -hmm. uh, but as, yeah, and and but also to express you know love and commitment yep. and all the things that jewelry does, and and so think about what kind of commodity just as a building block you need to do that. You want one that will last forever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which, which is kind of the whole point of, of jewelry. Uh, and so, but if you think about it in a monetary standpoint, it's actually the same thing. Uh, it's, it's something that you want to, to, you know, it's very scarce and very rare, but mm -hmm. it'll last forever, right? Uh, and, and in an economic standpoint, what that means is, is it doesn't have a, a carry, right? It, it doesn't, uh, you know, whether it's decaying or it costs a lot to store or move. Uh, so gold is a very low carry, um, but, it, but it'll, uh, so, so it's basically 
duration risk free, right? So, so that's so its financial use is actually very similar to its uh, industrial use. And then if you add electronics, it's the same thing, right? You can pass electrons through it without it decaying, and it, it just sort of you know a low carry, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's sort of the framework. So we had to think about okay, in that context, then thinking about currency and real interest rates and the carry on a currency versus uh, the energy cost and the carry on on the numerator. Yep. So that that's the model. Uh, I probably could have explained it a little bit more succinctly, but. Uh, no, I, 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 uh, I think a lot of people, they actually just need you to speak in English, which you just did, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, but the energy cost, so again, yeah. if it's 60% is the cost yeah. to produce, yep. and energy is the biggest component. Right. Um, you know, how, I guess, how reliant is your, 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 your outlook on gold to, to your forward outlook on the energy price? It, it's, that's, you know, they're, they're one and the same. Yeah, <laughs> more, they're, more they're, or less, they're right? dynamically tied together. It's, okay. And, and that's what gold always was. Like, even if you think about, you know, um, you know inflation and you look at, uh, you know, the you know, f volatile food and energy was supposed to mean revert. Right. And it did when money was gold because that was the mean reversion. It was the duration risk free energy, basically, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so looking at energy, there, there's been two things that have made gold sort of you know, quite volatile and have this big move in the, in the early 2000s, this big decline, and kind of where it's moved now. Uh, there's actually two pieces that are moving, and that's the hard part to, for people to separate is, uh, one was the movement in the dollar, and the other one was the structural move in energy. energy yeah. uh, and so what we've had, uh, you know, basically we had both those positive feedback loops happening in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. right, where we had a structurally higher uh, energy cost as the yeah. as the uh, cost curve shifted with the, with the growth and urbanization of China, uh, for the most part. Um, so so we sort of wore off that surplus of energy after 30, 40 years, <laughs> uh, and and we started sort of structurally moving into a ener new energy environment. Um, and at the same time, you know, and the there's obviously a lot of you know correlation and feedbacks from this yeah. that was also making the dollar structurally weakening as well because we were big you know massive importers of energy, right? So so you actually had two things happening there uh, that were both positive for gold. So that was the big move from you know a couple hundred dollars an ounce to you know a thousand you know twelve hundred something like that. Mm -hmm. Then what you had after the financial crisis uh, is you had uh, you, you had it you know move even higher because mm -hmm. energy prices, particularly after China went on its printing spree uh, and just sort of consuming everything, um, you you had both currency weakening with QE2 and QE3 and everything that was happening, and you had energy prices continuing to rise, um, and so that was sort of the move up to like 1800. Um, so again, sort of both the positive feedback loops. But what what happened since that? The sort of 20 uh, you know the 2012 call it to to 2015. Uh, you actually had the the feedback loops going the other way, uh, the shale revolution, right? So we we structurally lowered the cro cost of energy, uh, which also created a better growth in the economy, uh, and we didn't run into, keep running into those capacity constraints of of commodities and energy, uh, which has moved us into this whole tech cycle and everything else. So so what you basically had is is gold falling on both en energy prices structurally falling, uh, as also as real interest rates sort of crept back up after yep. after you know being deeply negative in sort of 2011 to 2013, mm -hmm. call it. Um, and then what we did is we bounced around for a few years uh, until Donald Trump happened, right? So we bounced around at, at a pretty stable energy price, a pretty stable real interest uh, rate uh, expectations, you know, using the 10-year sort of real interest rate expectations out of tips yields, uh, we were looking at about, you know, 50 basis points sort of uh, uh, real interest rates mm -hmm. and expectations uh, for, you know, kind of a couple of years. But what happened with Donald Trump and the tax cuts and the dereg is our expectations shifted back up into the sort of one percent range um, but uh, and and so gold sort of you know sort of sold back off again and and we th so the big risk or the big question for gold uh, was are we going to uh, you know can that keep continuing right can, can we run you know on a more normalized three percent growth in the US forever or whatever right yeah. so um, and that was the big sort of question uh, obviously and, and you guys were calling it earlier than anyone else uh, obviously the the economy rate of change was rolling over um, and uh, and so we we had this um, yeah this this reversion back to you know close to zero now already on real interest rate expectations. Crazy. So from so one quickly. to zero. Mm -hmm. And that was our big call was 
we always assumed <laughs> that this couldn't last forever. Like that was just sort of the <laughs> the, the assumption. But hey, maybe we, we you know, I, you know we, it, it lasted longer than, than most people mm -hmm. have expected. And tax uh, reform helped that. Yeah. I mean, you had this epic, you know, pinning of three percent GDP. And real, in, real interest rate expectations were high I mean, a year ago. Exactly. And then exactly. Be, yeah. And and so our our call was basically, you know, just like we made the 2015 call, uh, that uh, you know that uh, that the energy price decline was over. Yeah. Uh, that we were going to, you know, kind of move flat for a while. Um, and that this call was basically that 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 growth expectations was going to disappear. So there's only one way for gold to go, and that's replace high, re, reprice higher. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, if you throw up um, maybe just a picture to wrap around, so people uh, slide 33. And this is, you know, part of our, um, you know, part of our, our, our points on China. Uh, but just ignore the Chinese part, not really, because you can't when you talk about gold, uh, and you can't ignore energy. But this this chart right here, Josh, is pretty straightforward. I mean, yeah. this is the all-time high for gold back in here. This is the. Yeah. 40-year low yeah. high uh, energy, of the U.S. dollar, high energy High energy prices, low real interest rate expectations. Yeah, and now we're coming off, you know, this is a 20-year high for the U.S. dollar uh, on a trade-weighted basis. Now the trade-weighted basis, and again, we, I want to get into this a bit on what you define as currency mm -hmm. obviously matters, because yeah. um, yeah. your currency back here had a different mix than your trade-weighted mix here. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, we're not using the U.S. dollar index, we're using the trade-weighted U.S. dollar yeah. index which is, of course, back at a 20-year high. Um, so I guess, I mean, I think, actually, we walked through this with Buddy Carter. Some people, the relative value folk and the people that think that everything's static and, and linear, they would say, well, to get back to this all-time all -time low in the dollar, that's what I have to have to get gold to break out from here, from this level. I mean, and I have to have Chinese demand back to where it was at the peak. Right. That's definitely not the way that I look at the world. Yeah. Um, but it is a pushback that I get because, you know, yeah. we're bullish on gold. Um, so how do you kind of respond to that? Yeah, that again, thing? the numerator and denominator, uh, unless you're talking about gold, everything is relative. Right, right? and gold it's a Gold is the other change. one that's actually an empirical, it's, it's a gram, it's, a, it's actually an empirical measurement, where the other ones are, you know, it's a basket of, yep. of something else that's changing, right? So is yep. the dollar weaker, or is predominantly the euro weaker, right? Like, which, which one, or which, is one strong, one weak? Uh, or are they both going opposite directions? So that, that, that dollar index actually doesn't tell you anything about gold. Yep. Uh, it tells you a little bit about the dollar, but it also tells you right. a lot about the euro. Right. But so, if we were to just take a three-factor model, yeah. instead of this, I mean, we yeah. would have a currency, we would have the energy price, we'd obviously have the, you know, the, the, the output or the gold price. Yep. And what else would we include? Uh, so, well, one thing that when I look about the energy price is it's, it's actually quite important. Um, we've been in a very, I'd say, boring uh, energy price environment. Yeah. Uh, but Post we've been crash. in, a, in, a, in a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but we've been in an extremely interesting and uh, in so, in sort of multi-hundred-year generational change uh, in our actually energy, uh, like the energy revolution that's happening is actually probably one of the most important things, uh, even though the price isn't telling you much about that, yep. <laughs> right? Right now. So uh, right, I exactly. So um, you know, going into the energy market and outlook a little bit, uh, you know, starting with oil. Uh, mm -hmm. Oil is always uh, the, the easiest one to sort of wrap your head around because uh, it's it's the global highest energy density. So it's Sort of links all these other markets, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you if you look at what's happening, it's extremely interesting in that we basically uh, have been drawing inventories all year. Uh, you know, but uh, you know, supply growth has been you know pretty terrible uh, this year, um, but demand growth has been just as terrible. <laughs> right? So, uh, despite anything that's happening in the stock market or anything else, right. uh, the the underlying uh, energy market has been uh, yeah you know pretty much flat supply, flat demand. I thought the bean deal was going to change that. I thought, the, yeah, I thought everything <laughs> yeah. changed last week. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Apparently, no, the oil market did not think so. No. No. Which is kind of interesting, given that there was also a, a not inconsequential attack. Uh, on the yeah. the most important facility in Saudi Arabia. Exactly, and four weeks later, we're you know basically right lower prices. Like that didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. it didn't happen. And but because what the oil market is pricing is what's happening in 2021, right. which is basically recession uh, and uh, and you know actually going back to a year year on year supply growth mm -hmm. uh, because we're we're sort of at the end of, uh, of of the sort of the investment cycle from five six years ago, and so we're starting to get some new production. Uh, so basically, the the last of the non OPEC production uh, is is growing. Next year, mm -hmm. um, so so the market's already pricing that we're going to be oversupplied next year. Mm -hmm. um, now, after that is super interesting, um, but the market doesn't price more than you know a couple I of seconds was out. In front. Super long-term <laughs> investors. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what's really interesting on this, by the way, and, and notwithstanding the fact that we're just yeah. we just went bullish on energy for the first time, mm. energy-related. I'm talking about right. like good balance sheets. 
Good free yeah. cash flow. I'm not talking about lying CFOs and negative ROEs. <laughs> yeah. But um, I get more pushback on this, if only because right. I pivoted from bearish to bullish. But mm. the institutional community hates, I mean, hates right. energy. Right. And, and there's no, it's, it's, it's almost like all the analysts went away. Right. The hedge fund former stars are actually not at work. Wow. Um, you know, you, you, you are in a place, a very interesting place, yep. if you have a longer term view on energy. Yep. And I get my cyclical view. Like yeah. my cyclical view is that we're going to start to see dollars start to roll over and inflation accelerating mm -hmm. on a headline basis against easy quad four comparisons. Most of our subscriber knows what that means. Um, but 100% of the time that you go from quad four to quad three, energy is one of the best places to be. Hmm. Um, so I get, I think the cyclical call is both contrarian and it fits my playbook. Yeah. But the long-term call, man, I have no freaking idea. Like, I, I, I yeah. have no problem saying that. I mean, some yeah. people are like, oh, you're shorter term. I mean, well, yeah. okay, what is the long-term no, call? No, it's, it's super interesting. And again, and when I look at money uh, and I look at gold, I'm thinking about long-term expectations of energy, not, yeah. not short-term. Like how many so, years? Three uh, years? I'd, I'd say most things in financial markets is somewhere between five and seven years of some sort of terminal value or outlook, uh, okay. which lines up well with a CapEx investment cycle, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can kind of change uh, the structural over a sort of five to seven year mm -hmm. framework by throwing enough money at something, yeah. right? Uh, so or, or, no, or no money. Or no, or no money, as, as, as it's now Which is one of the biggest right? bold cases in any industry is CapEx and energy is going to be down five to 10%. hundred percent. And so, right. what, so what you've done is, instead of flooding the market with you know basically financial engineering and shale, where no one actually made any money, uh, <laughs> they just made a lot of cheap oil and gas. Well, some uh, people made a lot of money. Like yeah, the, you yeah know, sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the project didn't make an economic return. Let's, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's, put, it, let's put it that way. Someone, yeah. uh, someone made money, yeah. uh, all subsidies. By, subsidized by probably the Federal Reserve. I don't think but, they uh, took, I, I couldn't find in the 2015 um, Bank of America or JP Morgan mm. Qs or Ks, I couldn't find where they withdrew the, the bonuses of energy and MLP <laughs> bankers. I, right. I just didn't see that they took it back. I, th I think. I think people right. got paid. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the distribution was not, you know, as it probably should have been. But uh, uh, yeah, so so basically, what's happened now is um, because of that, uh, you know, there's really a, a downturn in the in the cost of capital and, and the financing of these things, right? So if you've got high quality reserves and high quality, you know, free cash flow, uh, we're actually in an era of, of high uh, ROE, which is which is yeah. why you'd be wanting to be long stocks with good reserves and, and good good production, mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, so, so, I, so I so I totally agree with that. But I think the the big structural issue, if you look out five to ten years, that's actually happening. Um, and it's, again, it's sort of semi-related to their you know the withdrawal of of, of, of capital uh, is the environmental concerns and and what's happening on uh, you know essentially funding these and the social pressure that's happening right. Yep. So uh, you know which is is it's an interesting dynamic because you know. Just you know, pure economics, uh, solar and renewables are getting cheaper and cheaper, mm -hmm. right? And they continue, to, they will continue to. Uh, and then the other piece that's happening uh, is is the shale revolution and, and what's happening in natural gas globally, right? right? And and now that we're had this major boom in LNG, uh, you're you're basically flattening the world's electricity basis uh, by basically exporting natural gas from North America and in Qatar and Mozambique and you know, Russia and elsewhere. Uh, and you're you're now shifting to a very coal dominant. Uh, uh, Economies in Asia, right. right? So, so now we're actually, you know, the, this this real interest rate kick and this economic, uh, you know, jolt that the U.S. got, not from central banks, but from you know wild, wildcat drillers, um, you know, basically is now going to be spread to Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the coal to gas switching that we had going on in in the U.S. is now moving to Asia, uh, which I think is going to be a big economic uh, jolt uh, to, to the Asian economies as well. Uh, so, so fundamentally that. That's that's all very good, but what that does to oil is very interesting because uh, essentially we're we're shifting you know transport from oil to electricity, mm. uh, and that electricity is being shifted from coal to gas and renewables. Mm -hmm. So we've got this major rebalancing of, of the energy complex complex happening, which is going to affect geopolitics. It's going to affect currencies. It's going to affect all these things. That the price has actually been pretty boring. So yeah. so so behind the price, there's a there's an, uh, a fascinating uh, shift in the energy dynamic that's changing politics, changing currency, um, but uh, you don't really see it unless you're digging for it. Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's like anything in macro. If you pull back the time series far enough, yeah. you can see all the secular expansions and declines. Right. In between, you have tremendous amounts of cyclical noise, yeah. and you get, you know, the macro tourism of it all is just landlocked on the most minute late cycle component of those cycles. So you're, yeah. you know, you, people can get lost in that stuff. I mean, we actually, yeah. I think we have a yeah. chart. Talk about people, talk about people getting lost. This, this chart you're gonna probably 
chuckle at. Because um, you're, you're obviously not just an oil man or anything like that, <laughs> but slide 93 um, in our deck, which shows you, this is, this is bananas. I mean, we're, we're short software and long energy right now, so we're having a good day today. But I mean, what's today? I don't know, what's today? Uh, this is, so this is showing you software versus energy right. as an S&P 500 index weight. Yeah, I mean, for yeah, those of you exactly. that don't know how to read this chart, this is energy down here. <laughs> okay, um, this is the former energy back here. Okay, right. you know, we're talking about epic distortions in mm. terms of people's anticipation or expectation of the future. Right. You know, we're going to put 15 to 20 times mm. um, revenue multiples mm. on the software companies. And hopefully, any company you and I create, yep. that'd be awesome. If I yep. got 15, <laughs> 20 times revenue for Hedge Act, right. uh, I'd still come to work, but that would be a great yeah. price to get. I mean, and we're going to put. Like you can get, uh, obviously, you can get a free cash flow yielding beast in Canada right. at basically nothing on a historical multiple basis. Hmm. So, I mean, what does that picture tell you? Uh, to probably do do the opposite part <laughs> right here, right? So, but you so, might do the opposite with uh, without knowing anything, right? Like literally, anything. yeah. You and, would just bet on mean reversion. And and the re, but but the mean reversion. So so a true technologist would say um, that that would be a terrible thing to do because you know basically being long energy is being short innovation, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, but what but is what that this? What they said? Uh, yeah yeah basically you know don't be long commodities uh, because you know we're just gonna you know invent ways to teleport ourselves to Mars and oh, bring so these back, are more like know. futurists, not yeah. like you know like yeah but but any 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 long commodities is being short innovation and, and being short sort of the human condition like that that's sort of the, the view right like is, is <laughs> this like is the barbaric. college dorm yeah. stuff <laughs> yeah no but but i run into this all the time being in the, at the intersection of technology and commodities really? so I, I actually am the guy that somewhere sits between these these bubbles so. yeah. yeah um but uh yeah so so what this would tell me is is just what capitalism does is that's really expensive and these, these, these companies, uh, and, and a lot of these technology companies are tech and software. What's their business model? Bra advertising, right? Mm -hmm. those, are, those are media companies mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part. So, uh, you know, are you, are you really buying something that's going to be projected to have that moat and that market power forever? Um, just like you're buying oil when it was way too expensive? You know, nothing solves a high price like a high price. No, exactly. <laughs> so, so people are gunning for those, and nothing, those companies. I mean, was this back, so, in, you'd have to remind me, I mean, okay. in Cowtown or in Calgary, Alberta, yeah. Is this isn't this where in Canada built those two towers? Is it, like <laughs> I don't know what the date was, but yeah. but now here Salesforce.com has the tower in yeah, San exactly. Francisco. I mean, it's like it's it's in 2007 in Stanford near mm. to us now. You get the big Wall Street buildings are built at the peaks. Yeah. I mean, you have everything that reeks of an mm. imbalance, right? And this whole cost structure for humanity going higher, which of right. which energy is one of the key components to that. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, like, I mean, where could it go wrong? Like, where, where could energy start making lower, I mean, uh, let's just use WTI yeah. or something. Yeah. Where could that start making lower lows from where, because my model is currently signaling higher lows right. on both a uh, intermediate yeah. term and long term basis. Well, I mean, look, a, 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 a severe dislocation in, in the financial system again, right? Like it, it, having to carry oil inventory uh, with, with you know, extremely you know, demand that's really collapsing right. gets expensive. And that's where the, the curve may not shift down, but mm -hmm. the front end may, may tank to $20 or something again, right? right. I think we're through that. Um, but but it in, in 08, happen, it right? went higher. I mean, it's yeah. like, I mean... But, but I, I think that was a little different because you still had massive secular demand growth happening in Asia, yeah, even though China. the U.S. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like as, as soon as, but you saw the whole curve shift when there was no, no one to fund it. <laughs> but, but, but the <laughs> I, second, I remember that part. But, but the second they you know, bailed out the banks and there was capital again, they went straight back into yep. energy, right? So you resume the, the, the previous uh, curve. But that was structurally cured by, by shale, mm -hmm. uh, at least for, you know, call it a five, 10 year window. Uh, that that's not permanent. <laughs> um, in fact, that's you know from pure oil. Uh, you know, forgetting about the the broader dynamic that oil is going to lose market share to renewables and 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 gas in, mm -hmm. in transport. Um, so you know, I don't I don't know you know what a peak oil demand might look like. Um, but you know, one one of the big problems you do have if you look out sort of five five to ten years uh, is that we are we're just not investing in the high capex, right. you know, uh, high complex uh, traditional uh, you know re replacement. Um, so you know, shale and sort of you know quick cycle. 
uh, sort of the manufacturing <laughs> of, of oil uh, is what we've got most of our growth from. Mm -hmm. But we're not investing in the super deep water and the major infrastructure projects. Uh, and we have to at some point, mm -hmm. right, just to replace the decline. Mm -hmm. So even if we didn't grow anymore, we still have to replace the decline. And I think we got about 30 million barrels uh, that we can replace for under $60. Mm -hmm. But we only have about five uh, that goes from 60 to 80. Mm -hmm. And then we go back onto the parabolic part of the cost curve where it's oil sands and mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, and then to add the environmental aspects, that I mean, that could be a hundred and fifty dollars, right? right? So, so we're not out of the the you know, even forgetting about what's happening with the dollar. Um, I don't think in the next couple of years, you know, particularly next year, we don't go back to higher oil price regime. Um, but after that, you know, looking at yep. you know, even despite what happens in demand, we could still get back into the sixty to eighty dollar range. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, by the end of the uh, you know, middle of next decade. Mm -hmm. My uh, friends at uh, Sailing Stone, they've written some white papers on this and and some of their. Um, you can see some of their work on, on hedgeye.com. Uh, they've, they've, they've made the case in addition to that. So you get your CapEx cuts, you get a malinvestment in yeah. something that's obviously gone to, 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 to the lower right part of this chart behind me. Right. Uh, but you also have had high grading of, most, uh, of mostly everything you yep. took the best stuff out. Exactly. So every incrementally invested dollar is going to be coming in uh, with lower returns. So it's just, it's just this kind of like self-perpetuating yep. problem. Yep. And that's what the, creates these lo long cycles in economics, right? So beyond the business cycle, you get these long cycles uh, that, that are really driven by this. You right. Know, 10, 15 year, you know, particularly if you're talking about takeaway infrastructure, not just not just the actual localized infrastructure. But, right. You know, again, you know, major, you know, all what's happening in liquefaction in the Gulf, right? Like that, that those are big, big, you know, long term, very expensive projects that need massive infrastructure, right? So that that creates much longer cycles than than even a sort of a short term business cycle might hmm. have. Cool. That's a lot. Um, yeah. We got uh, about five, six minutes before I take some questions. And, uh, so we, we, we ignored Bitcoin completely. No, no, no right? I was not going to let I, I have to ask. I mean, it's like, ask, I have to ask. Uh, right. Because you're kind of like sure. peeved about the digital gold narrative, and then you yeah. can, look just whatever you want to talk about on crypto. <laughs> I will accept it. I'll accept yeah. you for whatever you say. Because uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, so I I've guess. I've gone from bear, uh, bullish to bearish on Bitcoin. Yeah, I, and I, what I don't like about this part of the cycle, like I, I like, you know, and I don't want to be that sort of blockchain, not Bitcoin guy, you know, talking about the technology, because uh, I know that, you know, they are interrelated. Again, I, I ultimately, as I said in my tweet, I think, I think what's, what Bitcoin did uh, as a communication technology um, is, you know, is really unprecedented. It, it, it really has, I think it's changed the world both directly and indirectly. Directly in just the way we will sort of move through this next phase of internet, you know, data and digitization of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll sort of explain, you know, why and how that, that happens. Um, but, and it's also changed money and it's made us all think about it again, <laughs> right? And, and that alone, I think, is incredibly That's valuable. Awesome. Uh, and, and, and particularly in this era of central banks, uh, you know, everyone is sort of thinking about money again. So, so I think in those two ways, you know, I, I always think, you know, Bitcoin was, was supposed to happen. Like, you know, it was, it, was, it was the right time in the cycle for it to happen. But the problem is the narrative was almost too good. Right, so the narrative uh, is what's supporting it. Um, you know, if if I look at my framework and look at energy and and sort of a, a baseline and in, in sort of sort of base reality, <laughs> like you know, Bitcoin really is a pure abstraction, right? So 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 you know, basically, uh, it's 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 a tough. Uh, it's a tough asset to, to really conceptualize, you know, compared to gold. But the narrative was great with, you know, sort of being, you know, what happened after the bailouts and what's happening politically and populism and all yep. of this. It's got a perfect narrative, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what's happening with, with, um, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, all, all the spying that's happening in technology and stealing of data and all of that. Like it's perfect. It's, it, like it's, literally, it's, the narrative is perfect. If and, you're and that, if you're a libertarian, you could not imagine. A yeah. more perfect narrative. Yeah, and like so, some of my friends that are libertarians are like, were mad at me for not being bullish on Bitcoin. <laughs> right. And I'm like, dude. And then and and eventually we went bullish on it. But then back to bearish. It's like, but there's yeah. an ideology that's clung to this. Yeah. And that was I, almost perfect. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that's what's giving it this wave, the second wave. You know, maybe there'll be a third wave. Oh, I don't know. Plenty. But the problem is, if you start taking that narrative to now it's digital gold, 
and you've got to own it just like you own gold. Right. Uh, that's in my mind is just dead wrong. Uh, it, that that is that is not why the technology is interesting, and it's not going to replace gold's you know enterprise value or market cap. So so that's the big narrative that's happening in crypto right now is oh if we could take that sort of eight nine trillion dollar money stock of gold and we displace half of it or all of it, you know, Bitcoin yeah. will be worth you but know three thousand like, a coin. It's like picking on it's like picking on me the five foot nine guy at a, yeah. at a basketball trial. <laughs> I mean, it's like it, gold has no representation in terms of global <laughs> asset allocation. Yeah. I mean, it, what percentage of it is, is, is 0.2% to, yeah, of institutional asset allocation? No. And you want exactly. a share of that? Yeah. I mean, it's not like uh, it, th 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 that part. I, but to going me, back that, to the fundamentals, gold is not valuable because central banks you once owned it and because Scrooge McDuck owned it. Like, that's <laughs> not why it's valuable. Like, it's not narrative. Yeah. It's actually physics. Yeah. It's actually industrial use. It's yeah. jewelry. Yeah. It's, so, so the central bank allocation, uh, sure, it's important and it's important in the cyclical and the, and the short term supply and demand of flows. Uh, but it doesn't change the replacement cost and the energy, you know, sort of physics of what gold is. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, basically trying to say I'm going to take part of gold's market cap means are we going to start making rings out of Bitcoin? Are we going to start, you know, making electrical components out of out of Bitcoin? Some people out, out tried. Of, I think they have a tattoo <laughs> right there. It's yeah. like a back yeah. tat of a so, beat. So, so that's why I'm saying it's not going to take gold's market share. Whether it takes market share from other sort of uh, investment assets, I think, I think. Again, that the narrative is so good that it probably will. So I, I wouldn't necessarily want to be short this thing, but it's not digital gold. No, uh, we, we, Wall Street in particular, will create anything that ticks. We know right. that. <laughs> yeah. Anything. So it's it's wide open. It's got a good as good. I think you were talking about digital diamonds on Twitter. Yeah. Too. So, so so what I like, what I say is it is a commodity, right? So so what why? You, you call it Bitcoin? Op that yeah, it's a commodity because it's a bearer. It's a bearer asset that has you know that has a replacement cost yeah. in, in its you know in its scarcity mechanics, right? Like that. you actually have to consume energy and processing power and the degradation of you know microchips and technology cycles. All of that depreciation, amortization. That's real capital. That's, that's needed to create it, and then once you have it, you know it, it's you're not reliant on a centralized system. You can send it peer to peer, so it's a commodity. Uh, so you know that has properties like a like a natural resource commodity, mm -hmm. but it can be moved basically without friction anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. without a counterparty. So I, lo so that, I love that. Yeah, exactly. So that part's super interesting. So that makes it a very good diamond use case, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> and and what and what what are diamonds? All narrative. Right? <laughs> so, so that's why I say Bitcoin is like digital diamonds, and that it's got a very good na narrative, and it, and it has sort of a capital controls and capital flight, and and the things that you can do, uh, you know, you can do with with a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, so that's sort of the digital diamond narrative. The other side of it, you know, of the commodity that I, I, I say is it's, it's also like digital aluminum. Uh, I actually don't think there's scarcity of this stuff, and there is an energy cost, yep. uh, and there is a utility to those networks. There's an, a utility to public blockchains, um, but I don't think that it's limited. And you know, you can create infinite blockchains and stack the stuff to the moon, just like aluminum. And it doesn't make aluminum more value mm -hmm. valuable. Uh, it's still a commodity. It's high utility, uh, but it's not necessarily scarce uh, like gold. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's why. So that's sort of my. If I'm going to frame this as a commodity, it's more digital diamonds or digital aluminum, and not necessarily digital gold. I like that. Yeah. I own digital cattle futures. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm serious. Yeah. Like, I don't care. Like, yeah. I sold my Bitcoin and I bought cattle. Right. Like, am I allowed to do that, or am I going to now be considered like just not? I don't get it. You just don't yeah. get it. You don't get it. Like I get it. Yeah, and it's exactly. like no, no. I sold the one that started going down, and I bought the one that's going up because <laughs> yeah. they're both commodities. Yeah, that's the way I think about it. I, I'm ruthless in this regard. Some people think, but I mean, I, I, I go both ways, and I like it. Yeah. And it's like, um, why wouldn't it just become one mm. of you know the things that we consider commodities? I guess. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions on that, by the way, the yeah. queue's starting to fill up, and we have. Um, we have about 12 minutes yeah. for questions. The other thing that I don't like about Bitcoin and the narrative and just sort of a signal is if you look at all the other altcoins and particularly the ones that are just total garbage, uh, the fact that they're still moving in yeah. correlation and they still have market cap at all, like let, let, alone, let alone billions, yeah. uh, means that there's still a massive bubble, right? Oh. So, so there's other signals beyond Bitcoin that shows this is still, and I kind of you know, I make it like the analogy of like uh, a crowd bouncing a beach ball, right? Like it doesn't have to have fundamentals. You're just like charting what, you know, you know people are speculating on like how high the, the 
the, the, the beach ball is going to bounce. But as that like crowd thins out, it's like this music sucks and like, you know, <laughs> eventually the, the ball just dies. What they really like so. is the beach ball that's held under the water and owning it before it comes out of the water. Oh, yes. And that's the big, that's the big spike. But oh, then yeah. it's, it gets, the party gets a little well, less and that, fun. And that's what 2017, 18 was all about was Wall Street building that, uh, yeah. that reflexive narrative, right? Yeah. Where their own, their own capital could push this thing like, you know, like, uh, like the Hunt Brothers Silver Squeeze, right? Oh, like there was none of that. Wasn't no, there? No, 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 people I'm sure. weren't pushing it around. Yeah. All right, here's some questions. Um, actually, this, this is a real simple question, uh, but I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, very few people actually own physical gold. Hmm. How do you explain that? Uh, well, because in the financial, so that's basically that's not true at all on a on a on a numbers basis. Oh, yeah, if you look at the world, if you look at the world, right? Uh, okay. There's actually probably you know a couple billion people that own gold. Um, <laughs> this now, is like questions I get in the morning in the macro show. Now, I'm like, well, a that's not true. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's start with that. That okay. it's not true, uh, and then and then let's go to the next part right. is. Uh, in the West, and, and again, our sort of world, uh, we look at exposure to gold, right? Where we're playing, you know, right. and so people own ETFs or they'll, you know, trade futures or whatever, right? So, um, so it's, but, but we are a wealthy society where you can have other assets that are just as valuable, you know, real estate or art or just, you know, the general prosperity. So I, I wouldn't, I'd actually say the, the, the real sort of, uh, you know, demand for gold is, is, is actually at a lower income level yeah. um, because it actually is sort of your first entry into something. Thing of, of permanence and security and, and value, like pat, you know, after you get past like subsistence, right? Globally, so, though, I mean, yeah. like people in Thunder Bay, Ontario, where I grew up, or people yeah. in Alabama to, yeah. or wherever. I mean, pick any any anywhere that's not yeah. a place that has loads and loads of money. Right. They don't actually own physical gold. Yeah, you're talking about like somebody in India. Yeah. Or, or, but but, but we also lost part of a tradition, uh, and, and back to the diamonds for a second, our jewelry companies sold us out. So, so jewelry, even in the West, used to be a store of value. Uh, yeah. you used to, you know, if you talk to my, you know, well, you know, passed away now, but you know, my grandparents would own jewelry as, as part of their, yes. you know, just like real estate. Right? Stamps, so too. It was, it, was part of, it was part of their, their asset base. Mm -hmm. um, because you used to buy, even at Tiffany, you used to buy gold on a cost, or, you know, silver and, and gold at a cost plus basis like most of the world. Um, but the the heavily marketing and branding of luxury goods, uh, where you actually, you know, when you leave with you know a high luxury good, you know you you can only sell it again for ten percent of its value. Uh, that sort of eroded uh, gold and 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 jewelry being part of the Western portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously, I started you know uh, along with Roy Sabog, uh, you know we we started a company called Monet to to do Love exactly that. that. Yeah. You know, bring it back where you can buy sort of Western designs and, and that sort of thing at at a cost plus you know global model. Yeah, I bought my wife some stuff because uh, I was bullish on gold, so I just like hey. Yeah, put it yeah. in her stock, <laughs> nice. and then I showed it to her a couple months later. I'm like, see, it's worth more now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> for the first the first year, because gold went up 20 percent or whatever, awesome. the first every customer that bought Monet for the first year is now in the money. Yeah, in the money. <laughs> oh, so for those of you that don't know what Monet is, you should look it up. It's M, yeah. M E N E. Yeah. Um, and again, it's it's they're basically you know whatever you buy is yeah. marked to market. Um, yeah, exactly. In terms of jewelry, which is really and very cool. transparent, what our fee is, we'll, you'll see it real time the the price of the material, and then transparently what the fee is. I love that. Some um, people are asking like what you're up to on that front. Yeah. Um, the so-called this is an interesting one. Uh, the so-called boring energy industry price, Josh, can catastrophically implode if and when central banks are forced to get honest with interest rates. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I. I could I could grow to six feet tall too if somebody put yeah. a chair underneath my feet. But I mean, yeah. um, I like a lot of people kind of go with that counterfactual. Right. Um, but what, tell what, me one central banker, like in academia or whatever, that, that wants to destroy the economy by raising the value of the currency to three or four times its real value by raising interest rates, you know, ten times higher than inflation. Right. Well, the whole, but, uh, have you seen that academic no, school? Who, who, <laughs> so who, I'm not worried about but that. But what being forced to get honest with interest rates? These people yeah. are not honest, first of all. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 um, they are here to print. Control, print, 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 and until you change that, I mean, at some point, it's never and never. I mean, yeah. to be clear, um, uh, but betting that way or thinking that way, I would just remind you how much money you've lost over the years. I mean, people yeah. have shorted German boons, Japanese government bonds, some of right. the greatest securities in the history of humanity. No volatility, and they only go up. Okay, <laughs> who and how many JGBs, right. by the way, do you own? Right. Zero. I bet exactly. you. The answer for a lot of you, not all of you, is zero. Right. But the amount of Wall Street graveyards, yeah. hedge fund guys yeah. and gals. I'm short JGBs because mm. a negative interest rate isn't right. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. It's anyway. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. The um, okay. Let's say. Uh, but energy is is not you know unless you're in a, in a with good reserves and a low part of the cost curve. You know the, the the vast majority the marginal cost of energy right now is trading at its marginal cost. So so for it to collapse uh, for the whole curve to shift down, then you're changing the value of the dollar or any currency massively on the upside. Uh, and again, which economic school is, is, is asking you know someone to do that right now? Yeah, right. So, yeah, exactly. so I just don't see that as a scenario that I'd, I'd ever bet on. Yeah, um, in the crypto space, do you actually think Bitcoin is the longer term winner? Because you already talked about some of these other ones that are hanging around. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. But I, I just. I, and this is the one that you know, will definitely get me attacked on Twitter here, but <laughs> I, I just don't think that it, it, it will have some sort of, its network will enter entropy at some point. Like it, it, it will not maintain, it's not digital gold. Like it, you know, something it's better will come gold. along or it just, it will never grow to the point where, you know, someone said it's gonna be three times the size of gold's market cap. So that's like a, thou, uh, that's a million dollars a coin. Uh, so, so basically just to maintain the, net, the depreciation of the network, the carry on the macro asset uh, would be running about $300 billion a year. And the new coin demand that would be needed at that, that sort of the, that portion of, of Bitcoin's sort of 10 minute supply uh, would be running about $10 billion a year. Yeah. So you're telling me that the economy, uh, you know, in, in sort of in, in real terms, is going to spend $400 billion a year on, uh, on you know, digital postage stamps? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, like that, that to me is just so I wouldn't absurd. Go I wouldn't go that. Um, but, but a lot of these, I mean, a lot of these yeah. questions have to do with what I'd call old wall relative value relationships. Hmm. But they're just applying it to their crypto versus gold narrative. Right. Like there's num there are people, yeah. somebody's pushing these numbers around. One question is like, I've heard the opportunity in crypto is, com is compared to the arbitrage between 200 billion in crypto in market cap relative to the 8 trillion in gold. Yeah. I mean, so again, there is no call at HedgeEye that has ever been made on a relative value basis between two commodities, <laughs> ever, okay? And there again is yeah, a exactly. deep and lengthening graveyard of people who invest their macro funds that way, and I know it's going to offend people, but it's offensive to your LPs that you've blown up multiple times with those types of strategies. It is the rate of change of things. Right. Okay, so in your vernacular, yeah. isn't the rate of change the opportunity in terms of, let's park crypto, yeah. <laughs> the, isn't the rate of change of the cost to produce gold yep. one of the main things that you're, you're, you're focused on all Th That's the time? all, that's all, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the cost, the, my, my, my you know, very simple theory of everything <laughs> is, the, is, is the energy cost of production and the energy carry on the asset. That's it. I, I don't care what asset it is. I don't care if it's a currency, it's a bond, it's a Cattle. equity, it's a you know, building, it's the energy cost of production for, and the replacement cost you know, versus the energy carry. That's it. I love that. I love that. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, you know, when you have a process, you can articulate it simply. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not so simple to tell me what the divide is between 200 billion and 8 trillion between crypto and gold. I mean, that's an easy thing to say, but I don't yeah. think it's an easy thing to solve for. Again, the, the gold is priced on the, on the uh, marginal cost. You know, the marginal unit is setting the price of the money stock. Uh, and, and that still has utility, uh, again, in all those forms. Yeah. You know, jewelry, electronics, as a financial asset, it's all the same thing. It's a high energy cost and a low energy carry. Yeah. Uh, it, whether it's a use or a financial, uh, fin financial carry. Yeah. Um, this, uh, this Jordan here is at, uh, making a statement, uh, wondering if, he, if you agree with what he thinks. Um, or he's asking, are you, or is it correct to say that you're more bullish on gold here than cryptocurrencies? No, uh, no. Uh, in fact, so <laughs> we didn't even get to the outlook. I, I explained <laughs> looking backward. I'm done. <laughs> Forgot about Outlook. that. Outlook, that's, that's not for an economist. <laughs> yeah. um, no, so uh, I actually am not, again, for the next, probably the next year, unless you had a major dislocation in uh, inflation or, or you know, the value of currencies, I actually think gold is moving to a higher level. Um, but it, it's, it's a slow trend. We're not getting those, that positive food feedback loop of higher energy, lower dollar that we had before. Yeah. So, and that's the other thing. Is, but if is, we were to get that, that's what would get you a rate of change yeah. more positive. Yeah, for sure. But, mm -hmm. but, but gold is, uh, is, it trades like a currency. People want it to trade like Facebook or Google. They want it to trade like Bitcoin. They want to trade it like marijuana stocks. <laughs> it's not. It's a currency. And yeah. you're not going to get that explosive move in currency without a major macro fundamental. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's why people, you know, so many people have told me, well, you know, there's no leverage in gold. I'm like, it's money. It's not supposed to have leverage. It's supposed to just stay, stay even. <laughs> like, that's what money's supposed to do. Well, uh, but you know what money is. 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, so Bitcoin compared to that, um, yeah, again, the, the beach ball can bounce way higher. So, so if I was going to be long something because I wanted to make a 3x return, Bitcoin has far better potential to do that yeah. than gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bitcoin also has the potential to fall 80% again, yeah. and gold doesn't. It's, it, there's so, an interesting so, point. So like, it's the volatility. When I put it in my asset allocation model, because I yeah. did buy Bitcoin earlier this year in April, mm. I think it was in April. Um, I'm, if, I'm sure if it wasn't in April, those of you that know when I did, you're going to tell me when I did. I'm pretty sure it was in April. Um, but I put it in my, my bucket of 2% or less of capital. Right. You know, like a trade, like yep. a, or, or an options trade. Whereas gold e easily can be 10% of my asset allocation when I'm max bullish. Mm -hmm. So again, the beta adjusted, you know, uh, position is the way to think about the volatility difference in the two things. So again, if something has very low vol, like gold, gold got down to eight vol, yep. eight volatility. Yeah. You know, you want to look at crypto vol. I mean, obviously, to blow your blow your uh, mind if you've never yeah. looked at volatility. But so, be careful because uh, if for two days it falls below, uh, the Wall Street Journal is going to write an article that's less volatile than gold. So <laughs> yeah, they yeah. actually did that one. <laughs> right, well, I believe that. Absurd. But yeah, or anyways. you get uh, the, the the fine fine uh, people at CNBC to just talk about it only on updates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Josh, with China and Russia, this is yeah, an sure. important question because I yeah. had Jim Rickards in here. Um, mm. I think it was a month ago. And he, he brought this to the table, and, 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 and it really made me think. And this question did too, so thank you for that. Josh, with China and Russia and others trying to further away, get themselves further away from a dollar-based system, how do you see gold factoring into that? And do you see anything that, 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 that they could do from a technology perspective? People are thinking right. crypto, you know, a Chinese, Russian, Iranian. You right. know, there are a lot of different things that have been floated yep. around. Uh, but I, I, I personally, can, I could see that. I mean, yeah. if, if they are indeed the enemy, like we just walked through, uh, with General Spalding, which is, yeah. uh, for those of you that missed that, that's the stealth war. Right. You know, the more you believe that, the more you're going to believe the Chinese are going to do what they should do for themselves. Yeah, so so absolutely, again, like energy, this is the thing that's hard to trade right now, but it's probably one of the most important things to understand what's happening. So uh, so I 100%, I um, you know, including Europe, right, the euro was always about sort of, you know, rebalancing the domination of the dollar and, and, and that as well, right? Mm -hmm. So so absolutely, every country that doesn't have that reserve currency is going to be gunning for it, <laughs> just sort of by definition. Right. Um, and we are, we are getting to extreme levels to that, which the U U.S. is really not helping itself at all either, because you know if you look what's happening at um, at Libra, uh, you know I I took that you know you had, you had a couple senators basically sending uh, letters to Visa and Mastercard and PayPal, just outright threatening them to use their goon squad of regulators to, to regulate them harder if they they uh, you know on a political move, nothing to do with rule of law, whether it's legal, whether it's good for the country, that doesn't matter. <laughs> like if you support Libra and Facebook, uh, we're going to send regulators on you even more extreme. Like, I mean, that, that sort of thing is why people want to leave the dollar, right? right. Like, when you use it as a, as a weapon rather than actually a free market economic, you know, uh, you know medium, uh, you sort of lose the idea of America in that, right? So, and, and that's why the dollar had strength to begin with. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you start, uh, I, I think that these countries, you know, some is for, you know, political reasons that I, you know, wouldn't be supportive of, uh, but also just from a pure libertarian sort of free market, um, yeah, absolutely these countries are going to Try to try to break away from the SWIFT system and the U.S. dollar because mm -hmm. the U.S. is increasingly using it like a weapon. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know. I mean, the Chinese are short of dollars; they're hostage to the dollar. Yeah. Um, but to have something like that, maybe the last question because yeah. we uh, we have to wrap up. But the like, how long would it take? Or mm -hmm. have you thought about that? How long would it take to establish? some blockchain-based currency that's backed actually by gold. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. How long could that take? So, so it, it's happening, right? Like it's, that, that's actually part of the cycle that will ex get accelerated by the next currency crisis, right? So, so uh, that, that engineering is already happening, and then it just needs more fuel uh, for, for real demand that's, mm -hmm. that's more broad-based. Broad mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and that's why I'm saying, you know, what, you know, regardless of what happens with Libra, I, I mean, that is just a, you know, a phenomenal importance that, that uh, basically, you know, private company has gone on to take, you know, with, with market power and political power has gone, gone to make a currency. Uh, that alone just means we're in a whole new phase yeah. of sort of currency history, mm -hmm. right? That's good. Uh, and, 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 but, and if you look at why they're doing it, it's actually not so you and I can go you know, spend Libra at Starbucks. Uh, what they care about is emerging markets. Uh, they're using it because they've got you know, a billion users that are making marketplaces on Facebook, Messenger, and WhatsApp, and Alipay, 
uh, and um, and WeChat, uh, you know, Tencent and Alibaba uh, now basically own a majority of, of most of the e-commerce e-wallets uh, across the emerging market. Uh, so you basically have uh, you know you know basically Chinese central you know entities spreading not only the Silk Road sort of physically, but they're spreading it with with digital wallets mm. uh, through emerging markets. And you know and Zuckerberg with you know billions of users uh, everywhere wants in on that game. Yep. And if the U.S. is not going to help because Visa and Mastercard and AML and all of this stuff is holding him back from actually going to be an Mpesa in you know a, equivalent with one of his wallets in Indonesia or something, uh, he's going to be like, okay, well I'll just leave you guys and you know and the whole U.S. system because you're using it as a weapon and I'm going to go do it myself through through cryptography, mm -hmm. right? So I think this is a massively important story. Um, and uh, you know, Facebook <laughs> certainly is not the uh, the company with the, the best political will to be doing that right now. <laughs> but maybe that's one of the reasons why they did it. It's like, well, you know, no one likes us anyways. We might as well go do this. And, yeah, yeah. and what are the, what is their other growth right now? Right. Yeah. So so they copy, they buy, but but turning turning their user base into a digital wallet base uh, is is a massive opportunity uh, mm -hmm. that they're watching. You know, uh, Tencent and Alibaba doing and say we want to be in this game. Yeah, Neil Howe, our demographer, who you know. Um, mm -hmm. He, he, he always said it's such a good idea and it's such a good technology that a government's going to borrow it and yeah. use it. But that could easily be the government of Facebook, you know, that, yeah. that, that governs its ecosystem. That's, yeah. that's a, I have not heard anybody talk about it that way. That's a really interesting. Yeah, and, and the response has been now China's really kicking up the, the gear to, uh, you know, and probably through, it'll probably be through Tencent and, and Alibaba. Uh, they're pushing yeah. their, their now their, uh, you know, cryptographic renminbi. Uh, and, I, and I even see, you know, Europe and the U.S. now pushing their own sort of, you know, Federal Reserve uh, and Central Bank uh, initiatives even faster. So they were doing it already on a sort of trial basis, but now they're actually seeing it as competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things that, I, again, the, what, I don't, what I don't like that I think is very un-American is, is even, you know, people like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Apple uh, was, was basically saying, you know, we shouldn't be in currency, that's the domain of, of government. It's like, I didn't vote for that. Like, like <laughs> w w when did we vote that the government should have a monopoly on money and control the people with it? Like, when, we, when did we vote about that? Like, uh, when was that on the ballot? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, so, I've, I've never voted. I, don't blame me. I'm so, <laughs> no, no, I mean, but you know what I mean? Like, like uh, you know, I, I think the market should be experimenting with, with better money. I yeah. mean, uh, that's and exciting. Just like everything else. I mean, I think money is a technology, and the more you create a government monopoly, the worse off people are going to be without competition. Well, that's the best part about about America. I mean, yeah. you can have a, you can have, Apple can have their opinion on that and as much as Facebook and me yeah. and you. I mean, we can yeah. all have an opinion on it and something's going to be born out of that debate. Mm. And that's, uh, I think you've educated a lot of people on, on the debate today. So uh, be nice <laughs> to him on Twitter, by the way. You know, there's no... Oh, I don't understand Bitcoin just, now, you, know, so. just, you be careful with that. You know, I think he, he just, he just showed that he knows a lot more than a lot of people do. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. I love talking to this guy and we'll do it again sometime soon. All right. Thanks, Keith.